Thank you for coming, everyone, today. This is a great crowd. I'm going to keep this extremely brief because I know you're actually here to hear the artists and Fleur. So, Fleur Bressler, if you can come on up. She is a native of Washington and one of this country's most recognized collectors. <laughs> Most recognized collectors of contemporary American wood art. Uh, the exhibition downstairs celebrates the gift by Fleur and her husband Charles to the Renwick of 66 pieces of turned and carved wood. Mark Lindquist is of Florida currently, a pioneer in the field of wood art and among the first to truly explore the material sculptural qualities, moving, turning beyond basic production work into what you see in the collection downstairs. Michelle Holfutzel, I'm sorry if I said that wrong, Michelle. Uh, apparently of Vermont, please join us, is one of the most recognizable wood artists working with post-lathe processes today. Her heavily carved works have been influential in steering the field towards that technique. She is also a frequent writer on wood art, so we're very excited to hear her uh, views on the field. Norm Sartorius. Where are you, Norm? There we go, of West Virginia. Uh, exemplifies the fierce independence and style and technique heavily fared, favored in this field. Uh, as many of you know, he has both created and single-handedly dominated the market for exquisitely carved bespoke spoons. So thank you for being here, Norm. <laughs> Fleur, let's start with the, the, the most obvious question. Why did you decide to give this gift to the Renwick Gallery? I decided to give the gift to the Renwick Gallery because, as some of you here know, I am a docent here. And not only am I a docent, but I am also a collector of contemporary American craft, primarily focused on wood. As a docent, uh, I became familiar with our collection. and. In becoming familiar with the collection, I did have a checklist of the collection by medium, and uh, therefore became aware that we had a good size collection of objects that were wood art, but that there were gaps. And I w then went to the curator in charge, Ken Trapp at the time, and said to Ken, would you be interested in adding to the collection? And if so, would you like to come to my apartment and see what I have? And he said, yes. And uh, I said that uh, the only parameters that I would set would be that I had veto power. But otherwise, he could handpick anything that he wanted. So he did come to the apartment and uh, did pick out 59 pieces. The basic criteria for what he was doing was that uh, he was, first of all, looking for some artists that were not represented in the collection at all. Then he was also looking for work of artists that were in the collection, but that we did not have work indicative of a particular genre or time period of that artist. So that is the criteria for the pieces that you see downstairs. And Fleur, one of the first things that you said when you made this gift is that you hoped it would, quote unquote, validate the field to some extent. What did you mean by that? Well, I felt that, uh, well, up front, I will tell you, uh, when the gift was discussed, and actually when the gift even came to the Renwick in 2003, we never discussed a show and we never discussed a book. Uh, it was just that I thought that in rotating the permanent collection, these pieces would be shown and that it would uh, hopefully tweak the interest of the public. And I feel that the two things that give validation to this particular field 
would be that they are shown in a museum type setting and that hopefully there is uh, some written documentation. Well, I think what you're touching on here is that there was previously a, a bit of a dearth of representation in some museum collections and of documentation and of serious scholarship of this field. Uh, and so in, obviously in that sense, we're very grateful for the gift. But I, I wonder if we can open this up to the panel a little bit. Uh, do you feel that, that in the next 10 years or so that there, there has been a growth of interest in this, academically speaking, and what is the value of that and how much farther does that really need to go? Uh, does one of you like to start there? I think that there has been uh, a growth in scholarship in the field, particularly with the uh, Wood Turning Center, Yale University, uh, Wood Turning in North America since 1928 or 38. Uh, and that was one of the, probably the first scholarly treatments of the field. Mm -hmm. And it serves as an important um, uh, document. However, um, we have a lack of serious, credible art historical uh, uh, involvement. Historians, art, real art historians, and they're more and more coming on, but uh, certainly in, in uh, comparison to the art field, you know, fine arts, um, uh, craft has not moved as, as uh, wood particularly has not moved as far forward as it, as it should. You know, if you take Robert Hobbs, the endowed professor of um, uh, American art history at Virginia Commonwealth University, he's done a few uh, examples. I, I think that, uh, you know, people like Janet Coplis, mm -hmm. uh, Glenn Adamson, several others are taking it seriously. Um, and a lot has happened, but m much more needs to be happened. And, and I think it will. Well, and, and what I think you're, you're, you're touching on right there is the fact that academia is perhaps late in coming to wood art uh, is a direct result of the fact that wood art is not necessarily taught in an institutional setting with the very, very few exceptions. Uh, in a sense, maybe it needs to catch up a little bit to, to develop maybe more of a, a more formal uh, criteria for educating the field. And I know education is certainly close to your heart, Fleur. Michelle or Norm, can you talk a little bit about the, the situation yeah. there? Um, I appreciate it. N Nicholas sent us some of these topics ahead of time, so I had a little bit of a chance to think about them and make a few notes. And um, in, a way, in a way, my remark is more about um, a feeling that's embedded in these questions. This idea of catching up, it occurred to me that this field catching up to the field of fine arts is a little bit like asking when is jazz well and not when is when is jazz going to catch up with classical well, music well I, I i don't believe i ever said fine art but let's say catching up to to academia other media that yeah. have perhaps a, a different perspective on their own yeah, craft yeah i think there's a lot of work to be done i think there's a lot of work to be done by the makers because um in terms of art history I think any historian would die to speak to the actual live person who they're a historian of. So we're all here and we're alive, and, and perhaps we're not, <laughs> I think so. Um, and perhaps um, there's a lot of work to be done by makers to, um, I would say, to meet academia halfway. I would also hope that academia is also open uh, to meeting makers halfway, because it is, it is to a large extent a grassroots movement. And, the thing that I often think about, and I, and I said this once to Carol Sauvignon, um, I think sometimes we have this sense that fine art is sort of the glamorous older sister and that craft is kind of the gangly younger sister. I personally think of craft as being the great grandmother <laughs> of contemporary art. I love and, that. and there's a lot to be said back and forth, but we need to kind of meet on a common ground. And I, for one, am always delighted speak to Glenn Adamson or, or Nicholas or anyone. And I would, um, I would just, this is just my little cheerleader speech, would encourage all artists to be open to having those conversations. And I would also, since there are so many collectors here, um, <clears throat> ask all of you to be a bit more demanding of the people you collect to make statements about the pieces that 
that uh, are in your collection, and if there are any gallery owners here, that they should also um, hold a, a high standard um, and push makers to put in writing and put in speech what they're putting eloquently in wood because um, my feeling is that I've learned more from doing that, from writing and thinking about my work. Um, it's like the other hand. There's the making hand and there's the thinking hand. And when they're working together, uh, that's the best. Michelle, I think you make some excellent points. I, I do want to clarify, though, that the fine art craft thing, I, I think, is a, often a red herring. Um, yes. Their relationships are so complicated. But what I do find interesting about contemporary wood art in particular is the fact that far and wide uh, beyond uh, other media such as ceramics or glass or, or metal smithing, et cetera, it is the most self-taught field in contemporary American craft. Mm -hmm. that, it, that you came to this often as individuals, taught yourself as individuals, and continue to further your careers and the scholarship and education in the field as groups of individuals rather than as larger institutions. That's true, and, and as you say, there's a lack of formal education and that's a, a bit of a glass half empty way of looking at it because there's an abundance of informal education yes, that right. happens as well. So yes. uh, again, there's, I just think I strive for balance. Norm? Well, what I've been thinking about uh, as the other two comments were made is um, sort of builds on what Michelle said about documentation. I think that in addition to photography and ideas expressed about our own work and, and kept by museums or galleries or even ourselves if the pieces are still in our possession. Um, research is being done. Uh, Mark Safuri, for example, is doing research right now on Wharton Escherich. I'm doing a research project on a deceased woodworker. And it's very clear that we are doing better, uh, I think, than people were doing maybe 40, 50, 60 years ago mm -hmm. at retaining information and documentation both photographically and uh, other. So um, I'm trying to, I believe that no one other than a craftsperson really is better suited to do uh, that type of research. Uh, it's hard to find the time, but I think we are very tuned in to uh, what life is like as a craftsperson, mm -hmm. and we're tuned into work and how it's approached and how it's done. So I would encourage um, makers to consider uh, helping to document their friends, their acquaintances, or even to look into deceased well, and, and Fleur, you've said quite clearly that education is, is absolutely vital for the field, and I think what Norm, you're describing is a form of educating the field, which is in conducting your own primary research uh, and, and getting to know people and know their stories and know why, how they, and why they operate while you can. Um, do you have some other ideas, Fleur, on, on how you think education can be furthered? Well, I think that isn't the Smithsonian doing a... Uh, documentation uh, project through Smithsonian American Art in interviewing uh, living artists. Well, I believe Mark was actually just recently interviewed for that. Yeah. the I was uh, as well. Yeah. Archives. Right. How was Mer that experience? Archives of American Art. Well, Paul Smith came uh, to Florida to interview me, and it was great because, you, as you remember, Paul Smith was mm -hmm. the uh, director of the American Craft Museum. Um, and that was a wonderful experience because he knew about my history. Right. And, and, you know, that's the funny thing about history. If you weren't there, you don't know what it was. <laughs> and, and that's part of the, the puzzle that's missing is, is how do you go back and, and sort of unearth these, uh, you know, gems that are buried, you know. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, the Archives of American Art, I think, is a very special uh, and unique opportunity in America. The other thing which you mentioned, uh, and I know is near and dear to somebody in this audience, is the American Craft Council's library, which uh, is a little known gem of the history 
of American craft. Here. Now in Minneapolis. And it's now in Minneapolis. It is now going to be digitized, I believe. And that is a huge reservoir and resource for at least the back history of the craft movement. And you mentioned digitized. Yes. You know, that's a key issue today because all those photographs from 50, 60 years ago when, when you know, the whole genesis was occurring, those photographs are now in their decline. And if they aren't digitized immediately, they're going to be gone. Well, forever. that's something that I think everyone is trying to deal with now, and obviously trying to keep up with technology as material dies. Yeah. Um, since we're talking a little bit about uh, personal histories and education and, and making that connection with the past, Michelle, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your relationship with James Tristini, who, as many of you know, is often referred to as uh, one of the founding fathers of this field. Yeah, it was. Um I have to thank uh, Albert and the Wood Turning Center because I think it was maybe Albert knows 86. Um, they hosted an event at Craft Alliance in um, St. Louis, and I, I happened to be on a panel with Bruce Mitchell and James Prestini, and um, I had never met him before. And I must say, it was, I mean, I think Albert should have a sideline as a matchmaker because um, <laughs> there was just great chemistry. David was along, my husband David, and the three of us. Uh, went to a bar and had a couple of beers. But interestingly enough, we never talked about our work. I don't know what he thinks or thought about my work. And um, I admired his work, but I, I admired him. We talked a lot about the difficulty of making a living as an artist. Um, we talked about jazz. We talked about architecture. Um, and we didn't, we didn't really talk about the field that That's much at all. But we corresponded, and, and um, I'm just sorry that um, it didn't last longer. But, um, but there, were, there were many other people. Um, I was saying to Norm earlier, I mean, I can sort of claim some, uh, you know, daughterhood, I guess. Um, but there are many other people whose names are not known who were more significant in my education than Pristini. Mark, you wanted to jump in there? Yeah, I actually, uh, in 1978, Penelope hunter Stiebel, um, who was the uh, curator of American, uh, 20, 20, 20th century American uh, art at the uh, Metropolitan, uh, when, when my father and I were there um, for the pieces that they were acquiring, she took us to the vault and showed us this whole treasure trove of Pristini's work. This was 1978. Mm -hmm. And I was shocked uh, at what he had accomplished, that he had done um, his final show at the Museum of Modern Art in 1949, the year I was born. Mm -hmm. And I got to know Pristini really quite well. He was an irascible character uh, somewhat. We uh, arranged to have the pillars of the woodturning movement get their first awards in 1986 at the Aramont Conference. And he wasn't there. I accepted his award for him, and I, I sent it to him, and it had on the, on the plaque, um, you know, for contributions in uh, the field of studio wood turning, and he wrote back, "Get rid of studio wood turning. It shouldn't be in there. It's no, what do you call it? Studio wood turning." And and he was really um, more of from the Bauhaus tradition, and um, it, it, it was about making and um, in a different. Uh, era. Well, and, and you, you raise an excellent point here, which is, of course, the reason that the Museum of Modern Art and the Metropolitan and other museums, uh, the, the way in which they looked at wood turning at the, the middle of the 20th century was more as an industrial design mm -hmm. facet rather than what we might call studio craft today. I'm wondering if, if any of you would like to comment on that in interesting intersection between how wood turning has grown from uh, a, a, a design uh, a pr production. Uh, technique into obviously what it is very different downstairs. Well, I, I'd like to say that, you know, I think that this industrial design sort of, there's something in the middle between that and craft, and that's decorative art. Mm -hmm. And that's what, um, you know, the Metropolitan was trying to focus on, you know, what is this design aspect of, mm -hmm. of making. 
Um, and of course, the industrial arts, you know, really, if we talk about industrial arts, we really have to go back to train wear, where, you know, things were being made on pole lathes out of burls, and, and there's a whole history there. And for, for those of you that didn't see it earlier this morning, Fleur has been walking around the gallery today with a bowl that was turned on a pole lathe, which is a manual tread-powered lathe, um, just for kicks, I believe, uh, no pun intended. Um, I did want to shift gears a little bit and talk about the material that you all work with or, and love, which is wood. And uh, we, this comes up in part because uh, the press comes to see a show usually a few days before it opens. And we had a reporter ask here on Tuesday, she came and she saw the show, she said, are any of these words, are any of these woods controversial in use? Are there any environmental concerns with the materials that you're using? And uh, Fleur, your answer then I think was, was very interesting and succinct. We said that every wood artist is an environmentalist, but I know that there's a much more complex answer there, and I'd like some of you to tease that out a little bit. What are the issues that you confront with your materials? Well, I probably use the most uh, varieties of wood, and I'm probably the only one still using exotic woods, so-called exotic woods, um, rare woods. And uh, I get asked at shows couple times a show to answer that question. Um, personally, I'm using uh, what I think of as salvage from other woodworkers' businesses um, rather than purchasing uh, lumber or uh, large quantities of wood. My work is quite small, and I think over my entire career I would be probably using less than a couple pickup truck loads entirely over my entire career. Um, that doesn't excuse me from consideration of the, of the question, and I think you would find that almost every woodworker cares deeply about uh, trees remaining uh, intact and healthy forests and uh, conservation, but um, I really um, play off of wood in my own work. It's critical to me, it's necessary for my work to have a response to the raw material. I um, need the stimulation of great and beautiful and wonderful pieces of wood. And I think what people are worried about isn't really what is actually happening. I think the commercial um, viability of rare woods is what is lost, not the actual tree. Um, Cuban mahogany was cut to the point where there was no more, but the tree still lives. The tree is, it's not like the dodo, it's not going to uh, um, literally become extinct, it is commercially extinct. It's not available in that form any longer. So, I mean, is your sense that because of the, the, the quantity of materials you use and because of the way that you acquire them, is that in a sense almost a moot point for you as opposed to somebody that might be out there cutting down a forest? No, I don't think it's a, uh, entirely moot, but um, it's distorted. You it's, know. it's not really accurate in terms of our impact. I think a, a veneer mill processing uh, thousands of logs sure. in a fairly short period of time uh, is a far greater threat than a spoon But I'm, maker. I'm sure at the same time, I, I, I certainly anything that's being industrial manufactured is going to obviously explode in terms of quantity. Uh, but for Michelle and Mark, I know you're obviously using larger quantities of the wood than, than Norm is, perhaps more domestic woods, but when you're out there in the field, whether you're selling or making or talking to people, I'm sure this issue must come up. How do you confront that? Uh, well, we, um, you know, my husband and I have been in the making stuff out of wood for about 30 years, and we live in southern Vermont, right in the middle of the great northern hardwood forest. And um, we've developed really good relationships over the years with loggers who will be logging a 300-acre um, you know, piece of land and who would save out difficult pieces or burls that normally would not be wanted and um, you know, would sell them to us very cheaply. And when we were beginning, that was important. We had a cheap source of really interesting material, and so it was a very pragmatic choice for us. They happen to be extraordinarily beautiful wood, cherry burls, um, sugar maple, birch, um, 
And 30 years later, it kind of turns into a virtue. We can say, you know, we're the local vores of <laughs> woodworking. Um, so I, I guess I feel pretty much at peace about it. And when people ask, that's what I tell them. There's also the environmental impact of finishes, of using chainsaws. Um, you know, there's plenty to go around. But, but in a sense, because we're also, in terms of carbon footprint, we're mostly sitting in our studios all day and not commuting. Um, you know, all in all, I would say it's a pretty low impact um, activity. One I, other thing, I'm sorry, just, no, I just, uh, there was a point that I intended to add about the scale of my work relative to the trees that are, that are cut. There are many very beautiful woods all over the world that don't grow large enough to be cut commercially. Mm -hmm. uh, and they're suitable for what I do, but they're not suitable for a piece of furniture. Right. So I can take a, an obscure tree from South Florida that no one's ever heard of and uh, make a spoon, but the tree is not uh, threatened in any way mm -hmm. by... Mark? Well, I really, I love the question because, you know, in the 50s, my father discovered spalted wood on his land in the upstate New York Adirondacks. And, you know, he was a product of the, um, uh, the old guys who saved everything. And, you know, spalted wood comes from trees that are already down uh, on the ground. And he set a model, really, for the whole field, which was to use salvaged material. And, mu and much of the wood that's used in the, in the uh, field is, is wood that has, you know, come down in storms or or, or has been left over from a logging operation or whatever. So, um, you know, that's something to think about, that, you know, we are, are after the fact. We're much, much after the fact. There are, of course, many people who will work with exotic woods, and there, there are issues there. But I think everyone in the field is really aware and really attuned to these uh, issues of, you know, say, for example, tropical rain, rainforest uh, clear cutting or whatever, and, and don't want to participate in any of that. But, you know, that's just out of our realm for the most part. We're, we're really tuned right into where we get our materials and how we get our materials. Well, that's good to hear. And I, I think a part of that may be, of course, that uh, from the explosion of interest in this uh, field in the early 1970s on, of course, you were really, at the same time, riding a wave of in, new interest in environmentalism. And of course, being out there literally in the sticks, uh, you were, had a chance to, to look at the environment uh, dead on, head on and think about it as, as a, a larger body in that yeah. sense. Yeah, and right now today, I mean, I'm involved in a project where a huge burl tree was found behind uh, a, a person's father's shop that was being torn down and they didn't know what it was. And there was a huge drainage ditch that had to be, they were uh, upgrading the whole uh, infrastructure and the tree had to come out. And so they found me and we've you know, made a whole production out of it, uh, gonna be a PBS special. <laughs> and you know, we, we carefully excavated the tree with uh, archeological you know, intent and um, you know, lifted the tree out of the ground with a huge crane and, you know, have been very carefully doling out the pieces to certain artists throughout the country. Excellent. And, and it's a different way of managing material. I, I want to switch gears again because I want to make sure we have a chance to talk about this next topic. Uh, when we started putting this catalog together and, and developing the exhibition, uh, one of the first things that, that, one of the first questions that came up was, what do you call this field? Uh, wood turning was certainly a term that we'd heard a lot of, but we also heard the term wood art quite frequently, and we weren't sure how to approach it. And I know from talking with members of the collectors of wood art, many of which are in attendance today, that that is a question that you yourselves dealt with uh, at, at length uh, when you formed as a group in, I believe, 1997. Flora, I'm wondering if you can start us off on this conversation of how appropriate is this term, and what are perhaps some of the techniques that you're seeing more and more of since you're out there in the field quite frequently that, that justify a, a new terminology? Well, I, I basically use the terminology wood art. Um, I don't want to get into the uh, corner or the brick wall of art 
versus craft. I think it's been beaten to death. Uh, I always think of Sam Maloof. Uh, I think it's a name that's recognized by most of the people in this room. And he, to his death, I think, called himself a wood worker. Uh, no nonsense about it. Uh, as far as the field, from the time I started collecting, which was back in the 80s, uh, it was a vessel. It clearly was something that was a container in some way, shape, or form. I think if you look downstairs, we've come a long way from a container. Uh, there are objects down there that absolutely you could not use. And therefore, to me, it's wood art. You, you, you bring up an excellent uh, uh, point. Uh, we recently had June Schwartz, who is a, a, an enamelist and metalsmith here, and uh, Michael Monroe, who was moderating a round table with her, said, is your work craft or art? And she said, well, it leaks, so I call it art. <laughs> um, that's, a, that's a very interesting point you make. But what we, on the panel here with Michelle, Mark, and Norm, we have three people who have been largely responsible for, I think, the shift away from functionality in what was considered wood turning at that time. Uh, obviously, people that work off the lathe quite a bit. Norm, I don't think you use a lathe too often. Michelle, you work largely off the lathe. And Mark, you work with a lathe, I believe, more than the other two. But obviously with different techniques and different tools. Uh, I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit about that progression and where, what you think the future of that might be. How much farther does that have to grow? I, I have no idea. I really don't. <laughs> um, you know, the lathe is really good at making things round very quickly. And um, that's a virtue, you know, it's, it's, it's that's the virtue of that tool. Um, I feel like where the field is going has a lot more to do with um, the very difficult work of making a form, taking the totality of who you are and thinking up yet another iteration of that um, that's telling some kind of truth or that's telling a very uh, delightful lie, perhaps. Um, but I, I guess for me, how we're doing it isn't isn't um, isn't as naughty a question as why and what. So it's really the perhaps the philosoph philosophical underpinnings of your work that might make it, uh, bring it into a new realm rather than the, the actual process? Is that what you're talking yeah, and, about? Yeah, and, and the content, too. I mean, mm -hmm. it's, it's a struggle every day. Um, I, I guess for a more production-oriented turner or if a person uh, makes an object that becomes very emblematic and everyone wants one, and so you're making variations on a theme, um, that's one way of working, which I respect very much. But if you're... Um, if you're trying to say something more than isn't wood beautiful, uh, you've really got your work cut out for you and you're just, you're, you're, you're uh, siblings with the people who are bellying up to a blank canvas, a blank piece of paper, whatever. You're trying to put yourself uh, as honestly as you can into some form that hopefully people can understand, that is hopefully new um, and you know you you sit alone with that every day well you said something interesting right there you said that the the speed of the lathe is a virtue and yet I know for the three of you that you work very slowly and in <laughs> fact uh, some of your works can take a very long time. Mark's shaking his head, no? No. I, whip you those know, out? <laughs> well, you know, it, it, what's interesting about wood turning um, is that really the, the, the idea and what Michelle was saying, not necessarily the speed, but the fact that it does make a circular mm -hmm. pattern. Um, and there's a central axiality that runs through the lathe, through the wood, and into the hand of the maker. Mm -hmm. And um, where is it? Where can it go? We're, we know where it has been. 
you know, what, what, what woodturners look for, whether they want to admit it or not, is the gift of the machine. And it's a very technical process that everyone is pushing, you know, in, not only in, in a, a spiritual sense of the self and bringing to, to one's art to the, to the material, but also it, it just so happens that, that the lathe has been the crux uh, of the development of all this technique. And where can it go? I mean, the lathe has been, for the most part, straight. Well, what the lathe that I have, you know, with a, uh, a spindle that's running around s straight like that, the lathe that I have goes like this now because it's robotics. And the, the question is, where can that go? Um, I think that the lathe, primarily at this stage of the game, is an easel. It is a work-holding, work-positioning device for most people. And, you know, in what Michelle is saying, you know, the, the biggest thing that, that we bring to that process is what's inside of us that has to get out. You know, well, and the wood is just the medium. I'd like to explore that a little more. You, you call the lathe an easel, uh, but is that fair considering that this field, I think, arguably would not exist without that easel? No, I mean, I mean literally. An easel. Okay. In other words, the way a painter puts a canvas on an easel to okay. hold mm -hmm. the work, a, most woodturners today use the lathe as a device to physically hold and position the work while they work on it. So mm -hmm. it has been relegated from this device that's spinning so much to a device that's actually incrementally positioning the work. And in some cases, the, 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 in my case, the lathe is so that it can move to, to me ergonomically accommodating my needs. Mm -hmm. Norm, what do you think? Well, my, my career has very little to do with the lathe. I'm mm -hmm. sort of free of both the virtues and the tyranny of that piece of, equip, of equipment. Um, and tyranny is a word I've heard used to describe uh, the restrictions of the lathe before, which I find interesting. Right, I'm, I'm kind of that way in, in all my work. Um, at no point from start to finish does anything but my hands hold my piece. I don't ever, I don't use a vice, I don't uh, confine my work, and I think that is a, a liberating, freeing uh, characteristic of, of uh, my type of carving, anyhow. Um, okay. Well. Well, I, one of the reasons I wanted to explore what might be happening in the future is, of course, because since all of you have been working in this field and since Fleur, since you've been collecting in this field, obviously, as is demonstrated downstairs, you've seen an enormous amount of growth uh, from some of the production work of the mid-century to uh, this, these explorations that started perhaps 40 years ago for many people. I'm wondering, considering uh, the, the new terminology and considering the increase of carving, of embellishment of secondary materials, of use of artificial coloring. I'm wondering what these futures are because as we see downstairs, we see an enormous amount of progress through the 80s and 90s, which are the pieces that are in the collection. But that's, that's, a, lot of, that's a lot of advancing in a very short period of time. And we're in 2010 now. Where does that go between 2010 and 2020? There's a lot of energy. And I want to know where is the energy, what is the energy going to produce? Fleur? Well, I think one of the things that will factor in, and this may not be an answer to your question, is the technology. In other words, the tools themselves, the machine itself. Also, what new materials actually come into existence. Uh, Synthetic materials, you just, I mean, that I cannot uh, predict. Okay. We, we have, we're on the cusp, you know, of, of a, a real breakthrough in technology with robotics okay. and CNC, computer numeric control. Okay. And that has not really fully manifested itself um, in the wood world as much as it has in machine production and, and, and tool making and uh, uh, metal working. I think that that's going to be something in the future that comes along and it will do things that will possibly bring us back around full circle with additions. 
um, and, and will uh, enable uh, design to be more of a function of the object from the uh, from the basis of, of uh, involvement with the, with the artist. Well, there's a very interesting dichotomy here, which is that uh, on the one hand, uh, this particular medium in, in American craft is dealing with its most organic material. Uh, you're right out there in the woods dealing with something that is, is natural, it's delicate, it's sensitive, but it's so expressive. On the other hand, as, as you know, this field developed directly out of what you might call the tyranny of a particular technology. And so there, I think there is a very interesting tension there. So it sounds like there, there are other things going on in, say, industrial manufacture uh, that are changing those technologies. I wonder if we will see, uh, as we progress, perhaps a new tensions with, as new technologies perhaps enter this field and give you new ways to look at the organic material. Do you think that's a possibility? Well, yeah, I, th I think so. I, I, I have to go back to the, that term, the tyranny of, of the lathe. I mean, you know, really when you get down to it, we're all subservient to the material, mm -hmm. um, more so than just the process. I mean, we are, you know, our job is to work with that wood in a dialogue that, you know, either, you know, to get to get to express our uh, inner self or whatever through an imagery or whatever, as Michelle does, the form as Norm does, but in the end, we become subservient to that material knowing that it requires of us uh, an exactness of finish and quality. And I think I, I, heard, I heard you say the word bespoke. Uh, that's a favorite word of mine in terms of my approach to the material. Um, I guess I don't feel subservient to it so much as, you know, bespoke being tailored, but it's not bespoke. It's not like Fleur is asking me to make some something that's bespoke in one way, but I feel like it's bespoke that the, the wood is asking me to make it, to tailor it into something fine. And, uh, and that, that to me, all, you know, all technique aside, that to me is always uh, the best part of the challenge, is making, is making that piece of wood into some best self that, that's inherent in it. Well, of course, Michelangelo said that the sculptures were waiting in the marble just for him to let them out. Sometimes Sounds like you're it, echoing that it, opinion. It feels that way sometimes, and sometimes it feels like you're torturing it out. <laughs> <laughs> I've been accused of that as well. <laughs> well, I think that's a, a good place for us to leave off. Uh, I believe we're out of time, but we do have a window here for questions. Um, uh, please ask as loudly as you can. I will repeat the questions. If I forget to repeat the questions, please remind me. Right. Uh, so yes. Caroline. I, I'm wondering why this focus on a lay when it doesn't seem with painting that there's this incredible focus on what kind of brush or what kind of pigment or whatever that other people use. And so I'm just curious why we care all that much about you know, this lay or it's a knife or whatever. Well, I have my own opinions. Did you want to, anybody else want to start or am I the one that's been beating this horse? Well, as, as the non-lathe person here, I'll be the expert on this. Um, no, it, it just seems like um, the, um, here I go again, losing my thought, but um, somebody step in. The, well, the, the lathe really is a powerful force. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think that, that much of the field began through the use of the lathe, you know. Um, of course, there were carvers all along, but you know, if I remember correctly, you started with the, with the lathe, and it's then it's dissipating then now. Yeah. It yeah. seems to me. Yes, it, is. it seems to me that it really dominated for quite a while, mm -hmm. and right. there were collections that that had to be every piece had to be on a lathe, and right. they've expanded, and there were makers who uh, wouldn't consider working off the lathe, and now they're just using the lathe for maybe a half an hour of the whole process. I, well, I think there was a social aspect to it as well. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, you bring it up, and um, Ned Cook did a good job of bringing it up as well, that whole sort of post-war, you know, hobbyist in the basement. Um, if you wanted to make something, the lathe was something that was cheap enough to buy. You could get wood. It's not like you could make one at a time. It's not like if you wanted to be a potter and you have to have a kiln and you have to make several pieces. It was very accessible. and. Um, and, and I think that people were using it, and there was a sort of, you know, frankly, fraternal sort of 
aggregation of people who are using it, but it's, it's definitely evolving away from centrality. Well, and not everyone. I think you're edging towards the brick wall that Fleur had mentioned <laughs> earlier. That's okay. We have these conversations every day from nine to five. Yeah. Um, but if I may just uh, interject there about the lathe, um, the reason I've been bringing this up as a subject is because I'm certainly not a, a wood artist or a wood collector. I'm somebody who's a generalist. And so approaching this field from outside of it, what really struck me was that perhaps more than many media that I deal with on a regular basis, this is one with a, a very obvious root in, in the technology, one that is much more recent than some, and yet the, the interesting part of that is that it is also, as, as I've stated in the catalog, it is also the earliest machine technology in human history. Mm -hmm. So you have here a machine that has been human powered and then powered by other means for 4,000 years, and it is the machine that is directly responsible for this field's existence, and yet, as the artists and Fleur have pointed out, the field is moving rapidly away from that technology. So where is the tension there? So that's just why I wanted to bring it up today. Uh, question? Uh, Albert is asking, for the, for the future, why did we include Dale Chase's gold box and Rory McCarthy? <laughs> what? Yes. Yes. Um, well, I cannot, answer the answer, I cannot answer the question why Ken included the gold box, but perhaps you can, Fleur. Beyond the fact that it actually was made on a lathe, that I think is the only uh, criteria that I know as to why he included it. Uh, you know, clearly you spin metal on a lathe. That may not be an answer, but that's a, you know the closest that I can get to it. Uh, you could also question why did he therefore pick a work of two artists that their work didn't touch the lathe. In other words, we have the uh, beautiful little snake that Janelle Jacobson made, and that's absolutely carved. And you have Norm's spoons, though I do have a spoon that has a spindle-turned handle, First one. but he didn't pick that. He picked strictly carved objects. I, uh, I think the answer is, let's ask Ken. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, in terms of the Rory McCarthy table, um, when we, uh, our collection is not divided as, as, or it's very hard to divide as, as neatly and tidily as perhaps we've suggested in the appendix. Uh, we have what we have. And we go to our staff and we say, okay, let's see, uh, what can we include in here that's uh, turned on a lathe? And we get sort of half of a list. And we say, well, that's actually missing a lot of things for no particular reason. What do we have that's also carved? And that includes half of things. And at the end of the day, you really want a broad picture. And so we tried to go as broad as we could. And in that instance, uh, um, Rory's table ended up in the appendix because I think there were many lathe turned items and obviously there was a great deal of work that, that speaks to some of this technology. It managed to sneak in there, but uh, it's less scientific perhaps than, than you might have believed. <laughs> yes, for the video, the question was in regards to the future looking at, uh, so let's say, foot powered lathes to mechanical la uh, electric lathes to robotic lathes to is the future uh, uh, 3D printers and scanners, and that was actually 3D, 3D technology was something that was running through my mind when you were bringing that up, Mark. Mm -hmm. uh, I think some of us probably read that recent article in the New York Times last week uh, about the advent of 3D printers. It's certainly a fascinating technology and one that I think leads to some very interesting philosophical questions for us in this field, uh, given our focus on uh, human intentionality versus perhaps something that's completely digital. Uh, but I don't think that's something that we can figure out in the next three minutes, unfortunately. Well, <laughs> well also, you can, you can, if you really want to go into it, you can talk about uh, virtualization, you know, uh, being actually in a 3D virtual space where the objects can exist in, uh, in, in a virtual world, uh, removed from this one. And uh, there are very interesting things that are happening along those lines. Um, I mean, it, it, it lacks museum heft, granted, you know. 
Well, uh, you make an interesting point, which is, do you really need the object? Uh, as, right. as somebody who works in a museum, I'd like to say yes, but well, perhaps when you're people going, that would disagree with me. When you're going to craft shows, you'd really love to be able to just sell the concept of your work and not have to schlep all that heavy <laughs> well, stuff. Well, they do it in Second Life all right. the time, Same you know. <laughs> as a collector, I will say, no, we want to be able to touch it, pick it up, move it, and feel it. A uh, question? Yeah. You, 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 you make an excellent conclusion conclusionary point, which is this field might not exist. I said this field might not exist without this technology. Your point is that this field might not exist without you folks either. And I think that's right. an excellent point to make. Uh, it, takes, it takes everything. Uh, I think we have time for one more question. David, David? David, uh, David is asking uh, or su suggesting that Hapsakwa try to begin a, a, a group for Orb the Orbital Sander. Uh, what I found very interesting when I attended the AW conference last year in New Mexico was, uh, of course, it was my introduction to the Ornamental Turning Group. I forget its name, um, but it only has, I believe, two or three hundred members as opposed to the many thousands of, of the AAW. Um, how, many, how, many, how much room, perhaps we can pose this to you, how much room is there to, for factions, let's say, within factions, the field? Factions who might fight with each other? <laughs> no. Well, you know, there's the... There's the um, segmented turners, I guess, that, that's uh, starting up now. But why are these things always segmented into technique? What about the... Uh, Don't ask me. You know, you know, why couldn't there be factions between the hollow and the non-hollow? Well, how about the... How about <laughs> the if you'd like to start the, the non-hollow situation, I'll, I'll tried, join up. How about the visionary and the non-visionary? <laughs> <laughs> Well, or uh, yeah, yeah, those yeah. who work in exotic woods and those who work with native species. Well, I mean, you could subdivide down to next to nothing. One of the people that attended this, uh, this opening last night for the exhibition is actually a basket collector, and he walked through the show and he came back to me and he said, you know, you should really do a show that's just things made out of white oak. <laughs> and yeah. uh, that's an idea that I had not had before. Yeah. So yeah. there, you can slice it any which way. Uh, I think we should probably cap it off there all scratching our heads, and uh, uh, Katie, I think we're moving down there. Thank you very much, everyone, for coming. I think this is really interesting. Thank you.